I've been reading and making videos about the existentialists a lot recently and in the past. Uh, recently I've made a video on authenticity, I've looked at Sartre, in the past I've looked at Nietzsche and Dostoevsky. I thought now would be a good time to reflect on that and try and write something uh, more practical about the existentialists um, as a exercise in reflection. So I wrote a blog post which I'll link to below, um, but I thought I'd off the cuff ramble about here briefly and always trying to bring philosophy down from the abstract and ethereal heights uh, and wrestle it to the ground in some way and try and make it useful. So five useful things I've learned from the existentialists. One, remember to laugh at yourself. I tend to take myself too seriously sometimes. Um, and if you look in the dictionary, uh, seriousness is synonymous with earnestness and conviction. And uh, to have a conviction about something is to have reasons for it, to uh, be certain about it in some way, to hold it strongly, seriously. And the existentialists in many ways reflect on the limits of reason, the limits of what we can know for sure. Um, Dostoevsky in The Underground Man, his anti-hero, laments his inability to hold or find or create a stable identity, a stable character. He has uh, ambiguous and inconsistent desires. He says at one point, um, I did not know how to become anything, neither good nor bad, neither a rascal nor an honest man, neither an insect nor a hero. And I think we can all identify with Dostoevsky's anti-hero in some way. Um, we all know what it's like to wake up losing a certainty we had about something the day before, um, losing interest in a meal uh, we've always loved, um, finding new evidence uh, about a belief we hold. So while conviction and confidence is obviously important, um, to hold something, a belief, an idea, to do something with such strong conviction at the expense of humility is an overestimation of our cognitive abilities. This is something Camus reflected on too in the myth of Sisyphus. He likened our lot in life to Sisyphus forever condemned to rolling a rock up a mountain only for it to fall back down, roll back down the next day. Um, we can not find ultimate conviction, ultimate reason, ultimate meaning for acting in a specific way. We have to make leaps of faith. Um, and uh, many people find this difficult. Many people find this um, paralyzing. And when I first read Sisyphus, I found Camus' advice at the end one must imagine Sisyphus happy to be quite underwhelming for one of the most influential writers of the 20th century. But one day I found myself laughing at myself uh, or a friend laughing at me, us laughing at something stupid I'd said, something uh, irrational that I'd done. And I realized that that's what laughter is a lot of the time. It's a cover for something more serious. Um, it's a way of dealing with the absurdities of life. The times you've done something incoherent or irrational or said something stupid. And in a way it keeps us grounded uh, because of that. Plato said that we laugh at past versions of ourselves and others because it makes us feel superior. But instead, I think it keeps us humble. Laughter is a cover for something more serious. So we shouldn't take seriousness, irrationality, stupidness too seriously. We should stare down the barrel 
of our irrationality with laughter and remember to have a good chuckle at ourselves. And it's just the age old wisdom re-articulated by the existentialists that laughter is scientifically, anecdotally, historically, good existentialist medicine. So rather than imagining Sisyphus happy, maybe we should imagine him laughing. Okay, the second thing I've learnt is to stop thinking. The existentialists, like the Romantics, were commenting in many ways on the limits of the scientific worldview. The scientific worldview is the dominant lens we view the world through in modernity. And essentially it's the search for causation. Now, we've always been a scientific species uh, in a certain way. We've always said or thought things like the seed will grow if I plant it there, hopefully. We ask what's causing a herd in hunter-gatherer times to move a certain way. So our minds in a way are built to think in terms of cause and effect. Um, and we try and predict the future in this way too. We try and collect variables. We say, if I approach something this way, uh, I predict it will do this. Whereas if I approach it this way, I predict it will do that. And we try and weigh up uh, different options accordingly. But a quick reflection on the nature of our minds, of our cognitive abilities, quickly reveals that that way of thinking is actually quite limited. Um, think about the times when your mind's been stumped by even a simple sum. I struggle with basic math sometimes because I'm so under-practiced. A lot of it is rote. Um, or a poorly worded recipe leaves us just stumped. I get it a lot when I play chess. Um, you think one, two, three moves ahead, and then your mind gets a bit fuzzy. You really can't think, well, personally, I can't think, and I think most people can't think, through more than a number of options at a time. And this is something the existentialists uh, were commenting on in a way especially uh, someone like Kierkegaard. But I'll give you an example quickly. Uh, last summer, my partner and I uh, were reflecting on whether we should buy a car. We were weighing up all the options, all the variables. Um, we live in the city, we don't really need one, but we wanted to get out more. How expensive would it be? What would it be like driving in the city? Um, bad for the environment, how much is fuel, insurance, parking permits, how much would we save on trains? Um, you quickly realise in even a simple decision like this, that the variables are vast and ambiguous. And then you also have the problem of weighing the variables against each other, which is subjective. How much enjoyment are you going to get out of a camping trip? compared to money you save. There's no rational way of weighing those two things up against each other. They're not uh, calculable. But then there's also the problem of many of the variables being in the future. You can't predict what's gonna happen. You can't predict how much you'll use something, uh, how expensive it will be. So the reason and logic is inaccessible to us. This is something Kierkegaard knew, um, and he advised instead that passionate action was just as important as reflecting. And modern neuroscience has commented on this too. Uh, Antonio Damasio has influentially argued that our mind uses feelings, gut feelings, somatic markers, he describes them, to process cognition as much as reasonable and rational thought does, that we'll get a feeling like a bear uh, scaring us in the woods produces a feeling of fear. And the feeling will present certain options to the mind. So it's like a screening process. 
So follow your gut is now scientific advice. There's a reason for it. Feelings are important. There's limits to our cognitive ability. Kierkegaard uses the example of the story of the Good Samaritan, who, as we all know, was walking down the road, uh, saw a man attacked, beaten and robbed, uh, and helped him. But Kierkegaard reimagines the story through the lens of reason and rationalism. And he says, uh, at first he thought what a beautiful thing it might be to help this person in the distance. But as he got closer and he had too long to think, he thought about all the bad things that might happen. The thieves might still be around. Um, it was getting dark, it was dangerous. Uh, he doesn't know, if, doesn't know if the person's telling the truth. The other person might think he is a thief too. And so instead of helping, he just walks on by. Kierkegaard said that reflection turns poisonous if it simmers in the brain for too long. So his advice was to reflect for a certain amount of time, depending on the problem. And we might also think about the opportunity cost of other things we might be doing while we're reflecting for too long but reflect on our intuitions too. And then after a set amount of time, passionately and decisively act. Okay, number three is always be creative. One of the things that unites the existentialists is their commentary on authenticity, which uh, the philosopher Jacob Gollum has written is a protest against externally imposed values. Uh, it's the idea that some things in the world are given to us from the outside and some things come from within. And if human meaning is human made, as the existentialists thought, then we have the ability to create many things ourselves, whether it's artistically, uh, verbally, whether it's just in our ways of seeing the world, uh, in our values. So. Nietzsche thought that there were two modes of living, in a sense, that we either adopted our values from others uh, and we we're often learning, absorbing, seeing, uh, or we create them ourselves. Um, and in a sense, this is just talking, acting, doing. But Nietzsche thought that the former was by far the most common. The anthropologist uh, David Graeber has also said that one of the great secrets of the world is that it's something that we make and that we could just as easily make it differently. Um, some people, I think, find this daunting. Uh, they think they're not creative, that they're not innovative. But I think there's creativity in every single action in some way. Uh, Graeber lamented uh, the rise of bullshit jobs, needlessly soulless, repetitive jobs that were just a modern curse. Um, and even the most basic routines have creativity instilled in them in some way. We can all bring our own interpretation and perspective to the world and do something unique. Um, if you look at the philosophy and the psychology of creativity, uh, there's quite a strong consensus that to be creative, something needs to be both original and valuable. But the post-structural philosophers, people like Gilles Deleuze, uh, have argued that everything is original in some way. No two palm trees are the same. Every time I say hello, it's uttered with different air in a different context. Difference, newness, uniqueness, it's imminent, it spreads throughout the world and everything that's done. And if you combine that with the argument that we are an inherently creative species, you get quite an inspirational method find creativity in everything. Heidegger thought that if we ignore our potential to be 
unique, authentic beings do things for ourselves, find our own purpose, be that unique little boutique artisan shop that if closed would be irreplaceable, that would leave a void in the town. If he thought, if we ignored all this, we would live with an existential guilt, we'd be angst ridden, and that this was part of our constitution uh, as humans. So while we can't all be great, historic, world-changing figures, we can all at least perform great, historic, world-changing, creative actions. So even the smallest action can be creative. The fourth thing I've learned is that all of our projects are connected and we should treat them like rocks. Sartre's most famous phrase, existence precedes essence, is the ultimate invocation that how we define ourselves doesn't come from deep within. Uh, it comes from the projects we're pursuing in the world, the goals, the ends that we're pursuing. And we look at the world through the lens of those things. Um, we don't see the world objectively. It's not neutrally presented to us. We interpret it through our different goals, through our ways of looking at life. Um, and a project can be anything. It's not a literal project. It can be um, a friendship. It can be, uh, it can be a character trait. It can be anything that we're thinking about uh, at the moment. Um, Sartre's most famous example is the crag that looks differently to the mountaineer, the geologist, the farmer. They all take different things from it. But a result of this is that the mountaineer doesn't just look at the crag in a different way from the farmer. They also look at music, hear music in a different way, take different things from it because of the way they look at the mountain. They look at food in a different way. They look at friendships in a different way. And what this means is that the ways we look at things are connected to the other ways we look at things. You know, one interpretation coming from this project will have a knock-on effect on an interpretation of another project. Everything is connected. And Analyzing, interpreting, taking a deep look at those connections can only make life more deeper, more meaningful, more fulfilling. Um, for example, I might listen to a song in a different way or enjoy a song more because I thought I used it in a video in a particularly effective way. Um, I like a particular beach because we went there a lot when I was younger. And it reminds me of certain feelings. All of these things are interrelated. Um, and for Sartre, the world only makes sense up against these projects. Um, and he calls the way we look at things like mountains, facticity, situations. And again, Anything can be a facticity, anything can be a situation, but the way we choose to approach it, the way we compare it and relate it to other things is what really matters. Um, freedom for the mountain climber only makes sense up against the different variables and characteristics presented to them through the sheer blunt cold facticity of the rock and how they choose to approach it, uh, scale it, overcome it. And we can think of anything in this way. We can think of particular attitudes or particular uh, emotions I have. I can take them and think of them as rocks and think of them as things to be analyzed, interpreted, and if necessary, overcome. And I think this is a more optimistic way of interpreting the traditional existentialist view that life is suffering. Sartre's view is more that no, life is just blunt facticity. We bring an interpretation to it and freedom makes sense up against it. We have to challenge ourselves 
and think of the links between challenges. Okay, finally, number five, switch off autopilot. If it's true that we are creativity needing and authenticity seeking beings, as many of the existentialists thought, how do we go about pursuing this actively rather than passively adopting others' ideas and values like sheep, like Nietzsche said? Take reading. I often, as I'm sure many do, find myself frustrated after, after I've been reading for an hour or so and I realise I can't remember anything I've just read. And I think we expect to be able to do things passively and then recall them at will, but this is absurd. We have to be able to engage in things actively uh, for them to become embodied within us, for them to become ours. Kierkegaard talked about this as subjective truth. Uh, he wanted, he said, to find a truth that was true for him. He wanted to grow in his own soil. It was a kind of subjective inwardness, a taking of the objective world and making it personal, individual, unique. And he said one of the ways to do this practically is to engage in double reflection. So it's important to learn and it's important to then reflect. It's important to assimilate it to, with other things you know, to relate it, to engage with it. And this is more important than the initial passive learning. With algebra, for example, it's not the knowledge that's necessarily important. It's what you do with it, what you build with it, how you use it in your life. And this is what Kierkegaard thought was integral. He said to understand and to understand are two different things. And he wanted to be thought of as a 19th century Socrates. And Socrates thought of himself not as teaching people, but awakening knowledge within people, knowledge that was already there. He compared himself to a midwife. And I think it's true that we often on autopilot adopt and absorb the things around us without taking the time to really go over it, to move the pieces around, to think about it in relation to what we want to do with it, um, and how it might relate to something else we're doing. And especially in this age of information, of overconsumption, overabundance of facts and interpretations, we consume too much, we overconsume, but we underthink. And I think much better to know one thing well and uniquely and to be able to put your own spin on it and to really feel it from all its edges and to be able to use it in your own way than know many things poorly and unoriginally. Okay, what do you think? Have I left anything out? What have you learned that's useful and practical from the existentialists? Let me know below and as I said if you want to read a more lucid and articulate and long form hopefully all of those things anyway, version of this ramble, you can do so in the link below on my blog and you can also sign up to the newsletter slash mailing list while you're there, which I don't actually use yet because not many people have signed up, but once a decent amount of people have, I'm gonna be sending out stuff every week and writing a little bit more, uh, so do that. And subscribe, bell, like, you know the score. See you next time.